Hi everyone, welcome to Fiber Chats. My name is Irina. I'm the host of Fiber Chats. If you're new to my channel, love having you here. Please consider subscribing or liking this video or commenting what you like and who else you would like to see interviewed on my channel. My guest today is a Danish designer concentrating on needs for men specifically from hands on needs, DT Horndrop. Welcome. Hi, Irina. Thanks a lot. <laughs> okay, say your name yourself because I definitely mispronounced that. <laughs> of course. And I, I won't even say my middle name then. I just my first and my last names. I didn't want to. I'll work on that. <laughs> it's a very small town in a part of Jutland in Denmark. So, <laughs> well, welcome. Um, Thank you. So, tell me why men's fashion? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I think. Um, there are several reasons for that, really. Um, one major reason is that I always liked men's fashion. Um, and even as a youngster, I would wear a sort of classic menswear. Right. So like um, like the West Ham work now, if you can tell. Right. Um, or sixpence or a tie. Uh, I even wore a red tie for my 18th birthday. So I've always liked that a lot. And um, I think it's very interesting uh, to work with menswear. And as a knitter, um, when I was going to uh, knit for my husband, I realized that I didn't really find the designs, the kind of designs that he wanted. Right. He wanted something with a, like a fitted look. Um, and it just wasn't available. And I realized that my interest in menswear and the lack of what my husband wanted was actually, it was a major reason uh, for me to start focusing on men's knitwear. Right. Uh, so basically I want to offer what I would wear uh, myself uh, as a man, or which I, I would probably even wear anyway, but um, also what I think is somehow missing uh, within knitwear design. So, and I just, I really like um, the construction of menswear. Well, so, let's go back a little bit. So yeah. Talk to me about how you started knitting. Like, when did you find found out about knitting? Oh, oh, that was way back uh, when I was uh, a girl, a little girl. My mom taught me, and um, I made the the cowl thing. Um, that was back in the eighties, so it has sort of a rust color uh, thing. It was very itchy as well, <laughs> um, and I wore it all the time. <laughs> Actually, my dad had stored it for me, so I found it 10 years ago. Oh, then I didn't, I actually didn't knit for years, and um, I've been, I've been very much into sewing as well. So I, um, even when I went, I went to live in Guatemala, and I brought my sewing machine to Guatemala. Um, then I came back, and I just realized that it was, it's quite noisy uh, to have a sewing machine in the, in the living room. And all of a sudden, it struck me that I might be ready for some serious knitting. And so I started knitting uh, back in 2007 when I came back from Guatemala and right. became part of a knitter's group in Copenhagen. And so I just haven't stopped knitting since. <laughs> so how do you go from just knitting for yourself or the, for friends mm -hmm. and family to deciding to go into design? I think it's um, what I realized was uh, that first of all, I always customized the patterns. I never followed the instructions. Um, and part of the reason for that is that I'm not standard size myself. So I've got long arms, I've got a long back. And I just, you know, also when that's what, um, what made me start suing actually was that I'm not standard size. And so I would customize all the patterns. And then I realized that it's a lot of creativity. Um, to do that, and it's it's like if you if you like cooking, you understand the freedom of being creative when cooking instead of just following a recipe, and it's exactly the same um, that happened when knitting, and so I just uh, I realized that I needed that creativity in my life um, and the the freedom of designing, and so I started basically designing for my husband because um, he's very critical uh, about what he wants to wear. And I realized I really enjoyed that process. And I like all parts of the process. I mean, I like drawing. I like um, calculating sizes. I like thinking through technically. I like the yarns. 
Um, so it's sort of, uh, it's very fulfilling. Do you remember that very first design you did? Yeah, yeah, I did. And he, he hasn't worn it. <laughs> <laughs> What was it? I, I, yeah, <laughs> I think it probably has to do with the yarn choice as well, because he said, I want something really, really warm. And to me, that means really, really warm. But it doesn't, it, his, uh, <laughs> to him, it means something a little warm. But it's actually, uh, it's, a, it's a pullover that I made for him, but it was very thick and very itchy as well. But that very same design idea, I'm actually uh, still working on this now for I, in a thinner yarn. And the pattern will actually be released in October now. Oh, that's so but I designed that like 10 years ago. And it just never, I never finished that design. I knew that the design was good. I just needed to rethink it a little. So now it's a... <laughs> Working It's going to be a finished design for others to knit. Yes. Mm. So you mentioned the Ichi yarn twice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Seems damn. Do you think you became the yarn connoisseur? Like, do you feel like you're becoming more uh, critical about your yarn choices? Oh, very much, very much. I mean, I would, um, at that time, I would, it was actually quite an expensive yarn, but I had no knowledge about fibers. Um, the, uh, what I do now is that I like colors a lot. So the color scheme matters. But I also, from the beginning, I did make the decision that I was only going to work with sustainable yarns. Right. And so, because to me, environmental issues matter a lot. And also, um, the way it's produced all the way through the product cycle. So, I do often use, I've got certified yarns, um, but it doesn't have to be certified because there are so many yarn producers that are in process and they need support as well. So the most important thing is that the ethical standards and the goals or the visions for the yarn producers as well, because uh, you are allowed to be on, on, on the road for something. Um, but I do like uh, certified yarns because it makes it so much easier for consumers to make the choices. Um, but I support all kinds of yarn producers that take ethical standards and environment um, seriously. I wanted to show also that you can actually make uh, fashionable items with sustainable yarns. Right. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about colors a little bit. Yeah. Do you approach colors from what you would like or do you approach colors from like what do you think men would like? Um, both. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, I mean, I lived in Latin America, in Guatemala and Ecuador, and they uh, have very... Um, very flexible uh, understanding of colors. So they like strong colors in general, but they also, the way they combine colors are very unusual to me, uh, coming from a Nordic country. Now, having said that, uh, I was born in the seventies and I was always wearing mustard color or brown um, colors because there were no girls or boys colors at that time. Right. Uh, now I have two children and I understood that times have changed a little. So now blue is a boy's color and pink is a girl's color. And that I think is really um, something that we should um, work with. So I actually like to um, to challenge people a little on the, uh, the color choices they make. Uh, I don't think we should get stuck in those categories uh, about colors. And I myself, I like to, I mean, I always had an issue with the color blue for some odd reason. So I challenged myself and now I'm working with the color blue a lot uh, because it's a beautiful color as well. Right. Um, but I do uh, consider a lot um, what I think other people, um, what could make other people think about their color choices. But because I'm very tolerant towards colors myself, I mean, all kinds of combinations. Um, and I think it also has to happen with, uh, it has to do with the dyeing as well of the color and how the, the light uh, sh shows the color. Um, but it has helped me a lot that my husband is also, has influenced me a lot with regards to color choices. Right. Mm. So when it comes to gender perception of colors, hmm. um, who gives you more hard time, men or women about colors? Do you find um, more comments coming from 
women that like oh this is not for guys like or do guys ever comment on these colors are not manly i i actually think that um well i think because i if you talk about male knitters i think in general they are as interested in colors as um, women knitters are because once you start knitting you understand the variety of the color red right. and i think that um you can it, it's unavoidable that it makes you interested in colors and color combinations so i think within this community we are probably a little more open to watch colors but i do see a tendency i still see a tendency that uh if a man uh knits anything in color purple or pink it's something um is daring it's daring to do so and i just think it looks really nice on a man actually the color pink is beautiful on a man Right. But it is a little different for a lot of people. Um, um, I noticed in, in your blog, you talked about your daughter coming home from school and yeah. saying uh, like all the boys are trouble and stuff like that. And that yeah. really yeah. trying to instill in your children that is it all the boys or is it like those three kids that were causing trouble and are there girls who were causing trouble as well? Yeah. Um, do you find it a lot like when you work with because you work in the world of male design for men that you've been questioned like why do you only concentrate on that why not do everything like do people ever give you a hard time about that you know that's one of the things that i was really worried about um because who am i i've First of all, to try and enter the world of male knitters as a woman, I wasn't really sure how they were going to uh, welcome me, which, of course, I mean, that was just me because I've been welcomed. Um, but I was also worried about um, if I somehow would become part of a uh, discussion about, you know, why focusing on men. But then I thought, you know, nobody discusses why designers focus on women's wear. And that's really interesting. Um, so I, that was my, that was a concern because I think, I mean, I make men's wear, but I have women knitters that come and say, I'm going to purchase that pattern. I want that for myself. And so I don't tell people what to wear or what not to wear. Um, and the reason why I'm so explicit about focusing on male knitters is actually from a human rights perspective because my background is within international development and um, anthropology, and I also have, hold a master's degree of human rights. And I see a tendency that um, somehow men's issues um, are less discussed often. And so to me, the focus on male knitters is also because so many people still think that knitting is for women. So I wanna show the all the, the great I want to show first of all that there are many men who knit and also the great variety of male knitters so in short uh no I was worried I haven't had any issue I've been welcomed by women and men alike I mean it's never been anything right so you mm. use a lot of male test knitters for your pattern yeah. do yes. you specifically peak men to test need your your uh, patterns or is it just happened that there are so many volunteers i i welcome male knitters in particular um and that's for two reasons really um one is that it, when i use a male knitter it's a test knitter that is able to both give me feedback as a knitter but also as the wearer of the garment right. so that's one very good reason uh, the other reason actually refers to what I, I said just before that I want to show the variety of male knitters. Um, so that's also why I made the guide on Instagram on guides who guys who knit, because I want to show that it's for all age groups, all kinds of men. Um, but I don't discriminate. I do have quite a few female test knitters as well. Mm -hmm. um, very good ones too, but I, I do want to promote male knitters. Um, how do you come up with the ideas for design? Like, what drives your designing process? Uh, different. It's very different. I mean, I often, um, I wake up at night, I've got an idea, or I, I watch somebody uh, in walking in the street. 
I also, um, actually some of the designs that I'm, I'm working with now are collections that I worked on uh, when I did the knitwear design education. So I just, you know, I sort of developed collections and now I work my way through each piece. Um, but so it can be all kinds of, I don't know, I think it's once you actually open for those creative uh, juices, it just pops into my head. Sometimes it's a yarn, it's a particular color or someone who passes, it, it may be a woman and, and there's a detail on her clothing that just gives me a lot of ideas. Or sometimes I'm swatching uh, for a design and make a mistake and then got a new idea. Or drawing with my children, you know, a lot of uh, different um, inputs that just sum up. And I think really uh, the, the issue is not the ideas. Um, the issue is the actually developing a finished design and the pattern for others to follow right. and all the math uh, and layout because the ideas just keep popping popping up i mean that's not that's not difficult at all do you ever find it frustrating the fact that it's such a lengthy process that you have to go yes. through sketching through swatching through uh frogging whatever didn't work mm. like putting it together as a pattern clarifying the pattern testing the pattern publishing the pattern and then it's not necessarily going to make you a millionaire at the end do you yeah. ever find it frustrating that how much work goes into it and do you feel unappreciated as a designer i think that um i think i definitely underestimated the amount of time and work <laughs> And uh, maybe that was very uh, fortunate because otherwise I wouldn't have jumped into it. Um, I'm very impatient. Uh, my personality is is not made for these <laughs> very long processes. Right. And uh, before I decided to become a knitwear designer, I would never swatch, never ever. Just life is too short for that. And then you make some major mistakes and you realize that there may be a reason for doing those swatches. Right. And as a designer, I have to, I mean, it's, it's really important. And um, I think um, the, the thing is also that if I make something for myself, I know my body, I know my likings, I know all of that. I just made one item that fits me. But now I have to work in 10 standard sizes. And so um, I work with a lot of numbers. I work with a lot of sizes and different parts of the body. Um, and I must make it available uh, as it's, you know, I work with standard sizes, but something that really matters to me is the fit. Not only that it is fitted, but also that the uh, purchase of the pattern um, is able to customize it to the likings, but also to the shape of the body. So I do, um, in all my patterns, I give instructions because I really want to tell you how you can, um, in a very simple way, um, adjust the pattern. Because as a designer, I know my pattern very well, but as a knitter, you only just saw it. So I might as well explain to you what would be the best way of handling those differences that you want. Um, and so I, I do my utmost to actually help people. And I think that comes back to me as um, I have not stand that size myself and also my interest in sewing. So I really try to help people without confusing too much. I mean, just the, the most important parts really, um, uh, because, I think, and that's also part of the um, sustainability thought is that if you use a really nice yarn, you use the time and it has a really nice fit, then you will wear it with proud for many years to come. Mm -hmm. And I think we should be proud of, of our hand knitted garments. Um, and it's also because I think it makes people just feel better. How did you learn all the grading? What was your process of learning how to like grade the sweater or grade the trunks that you made? It is, you know, I, that's a very good question because it's, uh, it's actually really, really difficult. Right. And um, what I do is that I had some standard sizes and um, I boiled them down to 10 sizes. Uh, to work just just to work with only 10 sizes um and then i i it's a lot of trial and error as well because what looks good in your excel spreadsheet doesn't necessarily work well with the human body um so there's a lot of calculation 
um, and for instance, I'm doing these, uh, the pink uh, trunks for men, the um, pattern that was almost ready for test knitters now. Um, and so I actually, I've, well, the pattern is ready, but then all of a sudden it struck me that I had a very strong urge to actually finish my own test knitting completely before sending it off to the testers, because I realized that um, it's not as the construction is not that difficult in itself, but I need to see the finished garment on a male body. I need to see if it works. Right. And I don't want to waste my test knitter's time. Um, so I'm actually test knitting it, you know, these days because I really need to see if it works. Because I've done the math and I've been very thorough, but does it work in the end? Um, and that's always, and also part of it is just a matter of likings, you know, what kind of shoulder constructions and things like that. But I do have standard body uh, measurements that I work with, and then I explain how to adapt it to your to your own body um, when you knit it. Let's talk about those trunks. So they're like this sexy little thing that your husband was <laughs> modeling for you. <laughs> <laughs> Did he ever um, mock you about them and was like, why, why, like you can go to store and buy perfectly fine pair of underwear for a few euros. Like, why would you spend all this time and effort and to need it and where would you is it going to be like everyday wear with all that brioche in the front like what was oh those those are the shorts oh yeah the adam and fry shorts okay because the trunks are the ones that are coming up the uh, adam and fry shorts are the uh, two color brioche that i just released actually when i well we got to my husband uh he's not a knitter but uh, he looked at it and it was very clear that he didn't really get the grasp of the idea. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, this, this is going to rock the world. I love it. Um, and then he has tried it on quite a few times. And he told me, you know, you can knit, you can knit a pair for me too. Uh, he's like getting the customers because what happens is, and that's why the, the fit is so important to me, because they are extremely comfortable to wear. Right. I mean, the cast on is made so there'll be nothing too tight. I'm, I'm very uh, careful with those things. I mean, I the designs I do, they might be for fun, but they are perfectly wearable items right. for me. I mean, I don't make designs for myself. I make it for men. So it matters to me what men think. And that's why I usually do a mock-up. I mean, I do a sketch and then I ask my followers, I say, what do you think? And then I actually, uh, all the inputs I get, I go back, I draw a new sketch and then I start thinking the pattern. So for instance, um, I posted the idea about shorts and I said, you know, what would be the length of the legs? I was thinking, and I, I put, I don't, I don't remember how many uh, centimeters. And then one of the guys, he came back and he said, no, 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 no. For shorts, you will, we want no more than 10 centimeters on the legs because I've been doing workout all winter. I'm <laughs> going to show off those muscles. And I was just, I was pleasantly surprised because <laughs> Here I was as a woman, I wanted to cover, you know, those more right. uh, soft parts of the body, but he had a different approach. And that's why I do talk to, to all my followers because their input is really valuable. Right. Um, and so I went back and then I made the short, shorter um, realizing. But it, it's very interesting that, you know, and, and that's what, um, you know, in those gray days where you're doubt and it's a lot of hard work and, difficult to provide for your family. Uh, it does matter a lot when I get those comments because they keep me going. You know, they, I, I, they, I have men that come back to me and they say, it's not always in the comment field. Often it's a direct message and they say, you know, thanks a lot for doing this. We need you. I love the way you work and thanks for taking this seriously. You know, they're really happy with what I do. Right. And that basically keeps me going. And that's also why it's so um, it's so valuable that they, it, the designs I make, I come up with an idea, but then we work around it together um, because it's for, it's for them. It's not for me, basically. Right. Um, and also they come up with design ideas. Once in a while I ask for ideas and they come up with ideas. Have yeah. you ever had a design that you thought is going to be received very positively and there was no interest in it? Yeah, but I think it's, um, the issue is also that um, 
you know, it's like, I think all knitters have a pipeline of projects. Right. And so they may like what you do and you may be queuing in that pipeline. And so you cannot expect, I mean, I don't have a big name yet. Um, I don't have like half a million followers. So it's a, it's an issue that I'm developing. Um, and I think it's like, you know, uh, slowly you make it through that pipeline, you queuing, and then eventually um, you'll be next in line. Um, so what matters a lot to me is not um, if it's purchased straight away. What matters to me a lot is the co are the comments, the right. feedback that I get that I'm I'm actually you know I'm heading the right direction uh, because it just takes time. I I know that from myself that so many gorgeous designs and so little time, and so when people do purchase the pattern, I really um, I'm very proud because it's not the money, it's not, I mean, a pattern is not a huge expense. To buy a pattern is not a huge expense. What, what really makes me proud and humble is that this person is now gonna spend a certain amount of hours on knitting this. I mean, just the Adam and Fry shorts, it's two colored brioche, you know, it's not a quick knit, neither. Right. Right. Um, so that somebody's gonna sit down and do this for himself, uh, it's just, um, it really gives me, you know, um, it makes me proud, really, it does. Have you had people like meet your items posted on their social media and you like didn't even expect to see it? Like, do you have those moments when you like suddenly being tagged and somebody posts and you're like, oh my God, it's my pattern. <laughs> it's very nice. Yeah. And, and I think actually the, um, the color choices are always interesting. And especially with two colored brioche, um, because you know so di so many uh, different expressions. But I also think the way it's styled, I, the, the kind of photo they decided to take, uh, that is also very nice. I think to see because you you just uh, get a glimpse of the personality in those photos, which I think is very enjoyable as well. Um, and actually to um, to see a photo where um, they're wearing the garment. It's just, that's what makes you happy. It really is. Right. Um, do you, do you have issues with taking your own pictures? Like when you decide to how, how you're going to showcase your new upcoming model, do you ever get frustrated with like taking pictures and showing them to the best of their look? Yes. It's very difficult for me. Um, I never took photos <laughs> until right. I actually, um, and I wasn't that active on social media. So it's been a completely new language, um, but it does matter a lot. And I, I just realized that you have to um, think in colors and light uh, because want to, uh, you, you know, you, you want um, a nice photo, but you also want to see details or what I do at least. Um, and so it's uh, if, if you don't have a professional studio and if you don't have the uh, the expertise, you know how to actually take a photo. And I've I've, I've felt like um, like a fool many times. I'm really not that good at taking photos, but I just realized that when I follow other people and they do um, take very good photos, it does matter. It is really nice. Um, so I'm it's a it's a continuous work to improve. Um, on the photo um, part of it, but it's very difficult for me. So mm -hmm. like you look at yourself as a designer from 10 years ago to now, right? Mm. How did you change? Um, less insecure. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, I think the most difficult part has been to make the decision to, uh, to focus on menswear and male knitters. I mean, that was so scary. Um, because, you, you know, when I said, you know, I'm very interested in menswear and male knitters and male knitters, people, you know, give me that glimpse, uh, you know, it's like, are you from out of space? <laughs> I was like, no, 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 there are I, plenty of men who knit. And so I was very insecure, but I, I feel that I sort of, um, it feels good. I made a good decision and, um, I started in the beginning. I thought it was going to focus on women's wear. Um, and then I just realized that it wasn't really 
it wasn't really what I wanted. And then I started looking into men's fashion and I just realized that, you know, it's calling me. Um, so since I made that decision and accepted that's what I want to do, I've just felt a little more secure every day on what I'm doing. Um, and especially when then people come back to me and say, I really like what you're doing. Mm. That, it just makes you feel good. Because it's also, it's, it's both a matter of what your focus will be, but also the style. I mean, what kind of men's fashion are you then looking at? So mm. it's a longer process. Mm. So besides spending your time, and I'm, I'm talking about significant amount of time on designing, testing, yes. publishing, yeah. and all of that, you also have a household to run, two children of school age, and a garden. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and the garden is not located where we live. Oh. So we, uh, we go by bicycle 12 and a half kilometers each way, uh, which is absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Uh, we hold 200 square meters of uh, kitchen garden. Yeah. Why did you decide to start a kitchen garden? I mean, is that, was that always your passion to garden? Yeah, I like, yeah, and we grow vegetables. I mean, the flowers are sort of my, my husband. I'm, I'm into things that are edible. Uh, I've, been, I've been a vegetarian for many, many years, I think since the age of 18. And so to me, it was just natural to grow my own food. Um, and he, 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 he always liked it as well. So it's, uh, but when having children and we don't have a car, uh, of course, one has to consider the amount of time available for these things because it, it is a lot of hard work. Mm -hmm. um, and the season in, in Denmark is fairly short. Um, so it's very intense for uh, some months a year. Um, but then we also decided that exactly because we have children, we needed to, to maintain the garden because we really want to show them um, how to grow vegetables and how to take care of nature. And I mean, we collect garbage to bring to the garden and all that. We thought that was really important. And it's also, you know, we live on the third floor. So it's very important to the children also to, to be out with us in the garden and um, observing insects. I mean, they catch insects a lot in the garden and, and help us, but it is hard work. Mm. Do they have chores? Do they expect it to do certain things or is it like all fun and games for them? Uh, they are expected to do all sorts of things, but they don't. <laughs> <laughs> they are so busy. Uh, but, you know, then you see them uh, pick vegetables and eat it straight from the earth. And it just makes, you know, they, or the soil and they pull out a carrot and eat it. And then I know that, you know, that's the most important thing. That is the most important thing. Or you, um, you go and have an asparagus or, you know, just learning these things or enjoying um, looking at all the different insects we have or the birds or the bats even at night. And so that is the most important thing. But we try, we try to uh, <laughs> include them in, in the labor, but uh, they're giving us a hard time. <laughs> How many kinds of vegetables and fruits do you grow in there? Oh, oh my. Um, we have like, we also have a lot of different kinds of beans. Um, Oh my, we have uh, fruit trees, we have um, different kinds of vegetables, like different kind, kinds of potatoes, kinds of carrots, uh, lettuce, we have um, different kinds of onions, berries, uh, tomatoes, because it just, um, the, the idea is to show them a variety again, that yes, a tomato can be yellow, uh, because what you, what you buy in a food store is so standardized, so we want to show that, and um, for instance, when I lived in Ecuador and I had um, white ma mace, mace, mace yeah. um, that was the first time I experienced that. Um, so that really, uh, that was thought provoking. So we're showing the children that um, they, they, different sorts of vegetables can have different colors, different taste. Um, and so we will have a great variety of the same kind of vegetable as well. Um, and then, of course, we're a little limited by the climate in Denmark, but we do have a fig tree, for instance, uh, um, and a lot of different berries, because you also want to make the season longer, so that you can actually um, 
pick your fruits for a long period of time and vegetables almost all year round. So what do you find more relaxing, meditative, soul cleaning sort of knitting mm. or gardening? Um, <laughs> oh my, it's uh, two different things, I think, because the knitting is when I need some time, you know, space on my own. It's meditative in that sense. Whereas the gardening, I'm a very physical kind of person. So I have a very physical energy. I walk a lot. I go for a walk every single day. Um, and so that's what the garden does to me as well. Um, just to do some, um, some hard work is very relaxing for me. Um, so they serve different purposes. It's not creative. Being in the garden is not creative like knitting, but it is meditative in a different way. Do both of those activities also stress you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and they're not, they're not meant to. They are not, right. but they do. And I think part of it is that, for instance, again, because of the climate in Denmark and harvest season, we are busy, busy, busy at uh, a certain time of the year. Um, and then after harvest season, we must also sort of uh, prepare the garden for the winter season. And then spring comes and you have to prepare it for gardening again. Um, and likewise with the patterns and the whole design thing, I mean, what really stresses me is not other people's expectations, but the, the fact that I'm a little optimistic about time. So I plan for too much, my deadlines are too short, and I, I seem to keep underestimating um, the t amount of time it takes for me to knit. So I'm a slow knitter. And I'm also very um, focused. I, I, I really don't like um, mistakes in my hand knits because I want also to be able to show it to other people and it's my design. So I want it to be, be flawless. Um, but so I have to unravel once in a while, um, but I'm not, a, I'm not a fast knitter, but I think I, I am. How do you deal with like, let's say you send your pattern for test knit and the test knitter finds a mistake. Yeah, I hate it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but someone said to me, that is why test knitters were invented. Right. I'm very, very sorry with my work because I, I appreciate test knitters a lot. I really appreciate what they do. And so I keep doing those, especially the math, um, but I've just had a design where I was like, where, what was I thinking? Um, but I, it's very rare that they find mistakes because I am so keen on those things. Now, what they um, can do and what I ask them to do is if they uh, have suggestions for a better solution, I would love to hear that. So when I, with my test knitters, um, yes, I welcome male testers, but I also welcome beginners a lot. So I try to have a variety of very experienced knitters that can help me with uh, some technical feedback or ideas. Uh, and then I want um, beginners or less experienced knitters because they tell me where I need to explain better. Right. Um, so because part of my, um, my idea is also that I want my patterns of, to be available for all kinds of knitters as experienced or less experienced. So I need their feedback as well, because there are things that you just take for granted as an experienced knitter, or you understand what she means, even if it wasn't well explained. So no, I need- absolutely like true. I actually was doing a knit along on the pattern that has been tested and has been posted for a year yeah. prior to the knit along. And when we started knit along suddenly, and I invited like all the people who never tried Shetland Place before. So it was like all the beginners, basically. We had like 250 people and probably a good two thirds were beginners. And yeah. suddenly we start finding mistakes in the pattern. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that was because in Shetland Place, both sides are knitted back and forth, like both sides are lace. There is no right and wrong sides. They both lace, right? And the designer created that pattern specifically for the beginners. So she said, instead of knitting like normally you would in Shetland Place, you would do everything from one side, like mm -hmm. in regular knit. Yeah. And the problem with that was that it was uh, diamonds that were symmetrical. So it shouldn't have mattered, except there was two that were not exactly symmetrical. 
and the yes. experienced knitters who test knitted it or who knitted it in that year they were all experienced shetland lace knitters and they knitted it like they normally would so the chart works but yeah. when you don't know that and you need like as the instruction says everything from right to left suddenly the chart doesn't work just because of those two diamonds weren't symmetrical and nobody caught those mistakes because they were all too experienced to notice those mistakes you know exactly yes yes so the and that's time a, beginners come in very handy actually they are and and i had a test knit and they said i'm sorry i'm sorry and i said no 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 you're doing a great job i need to know these things if you get confused future purchasers may also get confused and i prefer to know it before it's actually released so thank you Right. I'm so grateful for the test that does work. I mean, I'm just, it's amazing. Um, even though there's no guarantee, I also, after the test knit, I write it through carefully. I, I always knit my own designs as well. Um, and then I send it off to tech editing. Um, I really do my utmost <laughs> to eliminate the risk of mistakes, but we are human beings. Um, so there is always a risk, but I think I, I, I really try to get around all different aspects. Uh, something that can could be misunderstood. So you do um, a different kind of pearl, or a twisted pearl instead of a pearl, or I mean, just little details. And it may be that the knitter was just uh, watching telly and didn't really focus well, but it may also be that I didn't communicate well. So mm -hmm. in the knitwear design education that I just finished, we also uh, discussed the whole communication. It's a lot of, um, it's a lot of how you communicate the, the pattern. You know, each sentence is very important because it's a technical instruction. And I know what I mean, but you don't. So my job is not only to make a beautiful design um, and make all the math, it's also to communicate in a manner that uh, cannot be misunderstood or is most likely to not be understood, misunderstood by knitters, all kinds of knitters. Mm -hmm. um, and that is that is a task, really it is. But that's also why I do a lot of tutorials myself um, from a YouTube channel, because I just realized that things that may be basic to me are not necessary to others. And if, um, if you're a Danish speaking knitter um, and you can only watch tutorial in English, it may be a little difficult to grasp. Um, and so I, that's why I eventually I do tutorials myself, even if it's also very time consuming, because I want to show exactly what I mean right. in this pattern. And it may be a well-known technique, but I may twist it a little, but people cannot necessarily understand that from, from the, um, the pattern. And so they can always go and have a look at the, uh, at the tutorial. Right. Now, sometimes it's much easier because people are like very visual. So it's much easier to exactly. see and understand exactly. how it works. Yes. Yes. Well, I think you're doing a wonderful job and I think you created a wonderful <laughs> account. And I hope Thank uh, you. to introduce more people to you through this interview. And I'll put uh -huh. all the description in the video under the video. So to show people how they can find your account and how they can get in contact with you. Thanks a lot, Irina. Oh, Thank you nice. so much for being my guest today. <laughs> Thank really you. Loved it. Thank you. <laughs>